brothers and sisters, good evening. Uh, welcome, shalom. Uh, it is a great joy to welcome you to the John Courtney Murray Lecture. I am uh, uh, Father Matt Malone. I'm the editor-in-chief of America. Um, the, uh, the John Courtney Murray Lecture, 50 years ago, was instituted to discuss matters of faith, of interreligious dialogue and ecumenical dialogue as well as the associated questions of the relationship between the church and the state and the religious and the political. Uh, we seek to honor the memory of Father Murray, who was long associated with America Magazine and was one of the principal architects of the Second Vatican Council's work on uh, interreligious and ecumenical dialogue. Um, and also on its Declaration on Religious Freedom. Um, we seek to honor him by providing a forum for discussing the very issues that he cared about, issues that are as relevant today as they were 50 years ago. On the 10th anniversary of Nostra Aetate, an America contributor wrote, uh, this is 1975, Perhaps the greatest accomplishment of our 10 years of dialogue of Christians and Jews is this. I feel that we have reached now the point where we can be honest and open with each other and can speak from our hearts and our minds without fear that the indestructible bond which unites us will be broken. But that is the spirit in which we gather this evening. And I would like to thank Fordham University for acting as our hosts, um, and also the, uh, a, uh, the AJC and the ADL, uh, who's, uh, who honor us with their co-sponsorship of this evening's proceedings. Um, we recognized this milestone in the life of the church and its relations with our Jewish brothers and sisters by uh, inviting Rabbi Daniel Polish to deliver this lecture the first Jew to deliver the John Courtney Murray Lecture. He was born in Ithaca, uh, New York, I'm told, <laughs> <laughs> uh, and was raised in school in Evanston, Illinois. He holds degrees from Northwestern University, Hebrew Union College, and Harvard University. From 1977 to 1981, Rabbi Polish served as Associate Executive Vice President and Director of the Washington Office of the Synagogue Council of America. Rabbi Polish has taught a number of uh, at a number of institutions and has also served on the executive board of the Central Conference of American Rabbis and on the editorial board of its journal. I hasten to add, he is also a frequent and welcome contributor to America Magazine. Rabbi Polish has been involved in interfaith dialogue at the highest level on behalf of the Jewish community, having represented the community to various organizations, including the Holy See, the Greek Orthodox Church, the Presbyterian Church, and a State Department-sponsored meeting with Muslim leaders in Southeast Asia. Prior to his appointment as spiritual leader of Shir Kadash, Rabbi Polish served as a congregational temple rabbi at Temple Israel in Los Angeles, Temple Bethel in Birmingham, Michigan, and Vassar Temple in Poughkeepsie. It is my great honor, indeed my privilege, to welcome Rabbi Polish to deliver the John Courtney Murray Lecture. It's my pleasure to, uh, to be here. I, uh, I am grateful to, uh, to America Magazine, my favorite Catholic magazine, uh, and, and to Matt Malone for inviting me to be with you. I'm grateful as well to the American a Jewish Committee and the Anti-Defamation League for their co-sponsorship of this evening. Uh, grateful to have the opportunity to share this uh, some reflections. Uh, actually, I'm especially grateful uh, to America Magazine and the two other organizations for giving me the opportunity to, to think critically uh, about the Nostra Aetate. Uh, and uh, the results of my critical thinking ended up in a presentation so long uh, that we would have had to end in breakfast. So I'm going to give you you also gave me the opportunity to, to kind of narrow down the focus uh, of my thinking. And it's, I'm especially grateful to, uh, to, be, uh, to 
be speaking in the context of John Courtney Murray. And even though I knew nothing at all about Catholic thought, uh, I did know about John Courtney Murray. Uh, and it seems to me uh, that uh, his book, uh, We Hold These Truths, and his work on Dignitatis Humanae, um, really contributed to the spirit uh, that resulted in, uh, in Nostra Aetate. Though he was not involved in Nostra Aetate himself, his work, his thinking, laid some, to some extent laid the groundwork uh, for that. Certainly it was Murray who brought to his beloved church the specifically American perspective of religious pluralism, uh, which is a great contribution. He saw that in political terms. The word that he would use was he saw that in social terms. Uh, in a way, uh, what Nostra Aetate is, is an attempt to uh, begin to express the theological underpinnings of the political perspective that, uh, that, that Murray brought. Uh, I feel blessed, all of us are blessed, to be living in the midst of a profound transformation. Um, my friend Pat Ryan uh, often says that when he's asked questions, he says, well, you know, I'm not really a theologian. I'm a historian of religion. Uh, and so as a historian of religion, I would say uh, that, uh, that Nostra Aetate represents a transformation in a religious institution as profound as any in the experience of re human religiosity. Tonight, we are an emblem uh, of that change. The idea of a Catholic magazine and two Jewish organizations uh, inviting a Jewish speaker to talk about a church document uh, is something that we could not have imagined 52 years ago. Uh, that in itself uh, is worth celebrating. Now, at this point, I feel like confessing that I mentioned that I did a lot of research about Nostra Aetate. Uh, one of the documents that I found that was especially fascinating uh, was a uh, was a reflection was a, a, a symposium uh, at uh, Notre Dame University. Uh, John uh, uh, Tom Stransky was at this symposium. It's a symposium at Notre Dame University on the occasion of the 20th anniversary of Nostra Aetate, at which one of the presenters was me. Uh, it, it turns out. <laughs> There, uh, I, I focused on the immediate moment of the document and its historical background. Uh, what I was trying to do then was to put Nostra Aetate in some kind of a uh, historical context, put it on a historical continuum, uh, see it as a product of a particular moment in time. Um, clearly, I'm not going to repeat that, because what I would like to focus on tonight is what's happened since. Uh, now, what I, I'm going to look at the historical continuum uh, but to continue moving forward. The fact of the matter is that for us, Nostra Aetate uh, is so precious that it's become almost a sanctum. Uh, and like all sancta, we tend to see it in mythic terms. Uh, and we lose sight of the messy human realities that surround uh, that particular event. So I do want to look just quickly with you uh, at the historical context that led up uh, to Nostra Aetate. We know that it did not emerge without opposition, uh, both theological and geopolitical uh, opposition. Uh, and the opposition that it encountered w uh, helped shape the document that, that came out of the Second Vatican Council. Uh, in fact, at one point, uh, the document was on the verge of being withdrawn uh, altogether and survived only through the dogged determination of the Jesuit Cardinal Augustin Bea. Uh, in the end, finally, the document was uh, was accepted. The document passed by a vote of 200, 2,221 in favor, uh, 88 opposed. Uh, but the end product was a document that talked about the relationship of the church to all uh, world religions, including Section 4, which was, a doc which was the part of the document of Nostra Aetate that spoke specifically about the relationship of the Catholic Church to the Jews. Uh, the document that came out was, in the words of Cardinal Bea, unlike any statement that the church ever made about other religions. Uh, the other reality uh, is that we tend to treat Nostra Aetate as singular. Uh, in reality, it was part of, uh, it, it, had, it, it comes out of a historical background. Part of the background is that historical moment. Nostra Aetate must be seen in the shadow of the Shoah, the Holocaust, and as I argued at Notre Dame University, uh, must be also seen in the context of the creation of a Jewish state. Uh, the creation of the state of Israel also, I think, uh, was
was part was partially precipitate uh, of menstrual cramping. Uh, and then there are several Christian prehistories of menstrual cramping. The uh, the history of of uh, Pope John Twenty Third, who was a nuncio during World War Two, uh, was responsible for saving thousands of Jewish lives. Uh, and in Europe, movements already uh, toward redefining the relations of cr the Christian world with Judaism, uh, which uh, eventuated in conferences like those of Petersburg and Appenzell. Uh, but for us, the continuum that we're going to focus on is the one that stretches forth after 1965. But first, as they say on television, but first, a quick review of the document itself. We Jews and Catholics are so accustomed to speaking about Nostra Aetate that we may have fallen into the reflex of assuming uh, that our conversation was the sum and substance of the document. It's useful to remember that as it was finally written, Nostra Aetate addresses all non-Christian religions. It has a section on the Hindu tradition, a section on the Buddhist tradition. Finally, we get to section four, devoted to the question of the Jews. Significantly, Section four on the Jews is the longest of the sections in the document. Um, of course, it was originally intended to be a freestanding statement about the church uh, and its relation to the Jews. It now comes the litany. In the course of section four, the document reminds its readers that Jesus, Mary, and the apostles and early disciples, what the document calls the foundation stones and pillars of the church, were all Jews asserts that God holds the Jews most dear, states that with the emergence of Christianity, God did not revoke the promises to the Jews, quotes Romans, in defining Christianity as, quote, a wild shoot grafted onto a well-cultivated olive tree, states that the, uh, the, the death of Christ cannot be charged, quote, against all the Jews without distinction then alive nor against all Jews of today, maintains that the Jews should not be represented as rejected by God or accursed of, uh, as if this followed from Holy Scripture, rejects, quote, all persecutions against any person singling out manifestations of anti-Semitism directed against Jews at any time by anyone, and expresses the wish to foster mutual understanding and esteem. That's a lot to squeeze into one section. It's also profound. It's also transformative. Section four, that I just recapitulated, is specific in the way that those other sections are not specific. Uh, and also deals much more concretely than the other sections. Those other sections are, 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 are presented on a much higher level of generalization and abstraction. Section four is bold and unequivocal. It is radical in the literal sense of the word in that it uproots previous teachings of the church. Section four charts a new course for the relationship between Jews and the church. There is no way to avoid saying it. It is momentous and transformative. We are living through the midst of a monumental transformation. I suppose I should stop there uh, and just celebrate Nostra Aetate. However, I want to mention section five, which begins with the powerful charge we cannot truly call upon God the Father of all if we refuse to behave as brothers and sisters with anyone created as all are in the image of God. Throughout, we are confronted with the church speaking in a way that it has never spoken since its inception. Nostra Aetate represents a tectonic shift. As a document, it is remarkable and unique. Certainly, it's the shortest of all the 16 documents that come out of the Second Vatican Council. Uh, 1,941 words in the original. Other statements reached to 100,000 words. Uh, Father Sidney Griffith of Catholic University has pointed out, unlike any other document produced by the church, Nostra Aetate does not, because it cannot, produce positive references to previous documents of the church magisterium. In other words, it, 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 it can't quote precedent because there was no precedent for it. All it contained was a single footnote uh, to a statement from the 11th century. Uh, Nostra Aetate, however, was not a coda to the transformation. Nostra Aetate, the 
document was the overture. Of course, Nostra Aetate is important because of what it did, but is even more important because of what it made possible. It is a seed that has been blossoming into a nurturing plant. I'm reminded again of John Courtney Murray. He died in August 1967. If he were with us tonight, he would not recognize the new realities that unfolded in the document issued just two years before his death. But then, of course, Murray had written, quote, do not repeat what I have said, improve on it, extend it, correct it, attack the problems it left unresolved, and improve it, extend it, attack the problems that remained unresolved. The church has certainly done these past 50 years with remarkable vigor. So let us talk about Nostra Aetate. When we do that, we shouldn't mean the document alone. When we say Nostra Aetate, what we should be meaning is the process that has continued from the document and will no doubt continue to continue. When we celebrate Nostra Aetate, what we celebrate is the process that was initiated in 1965. As Cardinal Walter Casper has said, Nostra Aetate is the beginning of the beginning. Significantly, when it was issued, it was not even seen by Jews as the sea change that it was. There was pronounced skepticism. My friend and colleague Noam Marins of the American Jewish Committee reminds us that the first official reaction of his organization to Nostra Aetate concluded with the words, much will depend on the manner and vigor with which the affirmative principles embodied in this, declar in this declaration will be carried out. And in the end, the manner and vigor with which the principles were carried out has been breathtaking. Just last November 10th, the, Commission, the Vatican Commission on Religious Relations with the Jews issued a document called The Gifts and the Calling of God Are Irrevocable, a Reflection on Theological Questions Relating to Catholic-Jewish Relations. In many ways, that December document is the fullest explication to date of what may have been implicit or was avoided in Nostra Aetate, the document of 1965. It is a profound expression of what Nostra Aetate has become. The document that emerged from the council was manifestly imperfect. <coughs> As noted, it would not have emerged at all had it not folded the, relation, the issue of relations with the Jews into a broader discussion of non-Christian religions. And yet the result of that compromise was to compromise the special significance of the special relationship that bound those two communities of faith together for 2,000 years. Over this past 50 years, the special nature of that relationship has been made explicit, affirmed, and emphasized. When in 1974, the Vatican established a commission to carry out the work of Nostra Aetate, it created the Commission on Religious Relations with the Jews. And significantly, it chose not to house that commission in the Secretariat for Non-Christians. Rather, the Commission for Religious Relations with the Jews was attached, attached to the Pontifical Council for Promoting Christian Unity but was structurally or operationally independent of it. In doing so, the Vatican emphasized the reality that Judaism occupies a distinct and singular place in Catholic self-understanding, suggesting that for the Catholic Church to understand Jews and Judaism is to understand part of itself. <coughs> Cardinal Kurt Koch the current president of the Commission for Religious Relations with the Jews made that distinction explicit. He writes, Judaism cannot be seen as one among many religions. It has a special relationship. And in his encyclical of uh, 2013, Evangelii Gaudium, Pope Francis discusses the relations with Judaism in a separate section from his discussion of relations with other world religions. 
and from this section on relations to other Christians, and from his section on relations to other Christian religions. Here's what he writes. We hold the Jewish people in special regard because their covenant with God has never been revoked. For the gifts and the call of God are irrevocable. And then, finally, last December, in the commission document, the second section is entitled The Special Theological Status of Jewish Catholic Dialogue. The first paragraph begins, the dialogue with Judaism is for Christians something quite special. And then the document goes on. For an outside observer, the conciliar declaration Nostra Aetate would give the impression that the text deals with the relations of the Catholic Church with all world religions in a relationship based on parity. However, the fourth article of this conciliar declaration, which deals with a new theological relationship with Judaism, represents almost the heart of the document. And it continues. From a theological perspective, the dialogue with Judaism has a completely different character that is on a different level in comparison with the other world religions. The unique bond between these two communities of faith, which may have been implicit in the document of 1965, has become explicit over the last five decades and occupies a special place in the realities of these two traditions beyond anything that could have been imagined in 1965. And that is emblematic of the evolution and understanding in every area that has taken place over the past five decades. One way that for us uh, to get a sweep of the evolution is to start with something that I said in Notre Dame uh, on the 20th anniversary of Nostra Aetate. I took note of the fact that much Jewish reaction to Nostra Aetate focused on the fact that six significant words do not appear in Nostra Aetate, the document. This, these six words that don't appear, by the way, are not the same thing as the seven words that you can't say on the radio. <laughs> six, six crucial words are missing from the document Nostra Aetate in 1965. The first of those words is deicide. Even though deicide was proposed in one of the earlier drafts of the document, it was removed from the final document. Next word is Shoah or Holocaust, even though clearly uh, the Shoah is a necessary backdrop to understand Nostra Aetate. Third word is Israel, the state of Israel. So as I've intimated, I believe that the creation of the state of Israel is among the things that precipitated Nostra Aetate uh, and also engendered much of the opposition to it. Fourth word is Judaism as a living and vital reality. Two other words, supersessionism and conversion or evangelization of the Jews. The absence of these fundamental terms, a skeptic might tell us, suggests that the church was either not serious in seeking to reformulate its teaching or failed to comprehend the reality of Jewish life. But the fact is that the absence of those words has been the subject of significant conversation in the dialogue that has been taking place in the five decades since 1965. And over these years, various arms of the church have issued statements that have addressed them and made profound gestures that dramatize an evolution in thought. So let's visit those six words, absent in Nostra Aetate, because in them we can see the evolution of the process that Nostra Aetate is. Deicide. No, the word does not appear in that document. Perhaps more troubling is the hesitant, perhaps oblique way in which it is addressed there. But already in 1985, the issue was addressed much more forcefully and clearly and concretely in notes on the correct way to present Jews and Judaism in preaching and catechesis in the Roman Catholic Church, which was issued by the commission. There we read, forgive me if it's a little long, the Gospels are the out, but this is quite a remarkable statement. The Gospels are the outcome of long and complicated editorial work. The dogmatic constitution Dei Verbum, following the Pontifical Biblical Commission's instruction Sancta Mater Ecclesia, distinguished three stages. 
the sacred authors wrote of the four Gospels, selecting some things from the many which had been handed on by word of mouth or in writing, reducing some of them to a synthesis, explicating some things in view, uh, in view of the situation of their churches, and preserving the form of proclamation, but always in such a fashion that they told us the honest truth about Jesus. Hence, it cannot be ruled out that some references, hostile or less than favorable to the Jews, have their historical context in conflicts between the nascent church and the Jewish community. Certain controversies reflect Christian-Jewish relations long after the time of Jesus. To establish this is of capital importance if we wish to bring out the meaning of certain gospel texts for the Christians of today. And now, all this should be taken into account when preparing catechesis and homilies for the last weeks of Lent and Holy Week. The meaning, I think, of, of this document is, is very clear, and what it says that the document of 1965 does not say is also very clear. It is true that the word deicide itself continues to be absent from official documents. But the rejection of the concept shines clearly through subsequent documents of the church and actions of its representatives. Are you ready for the second word? Judaism. Here we must acknowledge the role of Pope John Paul II. He elevated the dialogue beyond the words of Nostra Aetate. On April 13, 1986, he became the first sitting pope to visit a synagogue. He visited the great synagogue in Rome. In other words, the first pope to recognize the living religious tradition of the Jewish people, to enter himself physically into the midst of the living religious tradition of the Jewish people. There he called the Jews our elder brothers in the faith. He continued to visit synagogues on his travels around the world, a practice that has been continued by all of his successors. Pope Benedict XVI visited a synagogue in his native Germany, a gesture with meaning on so many levels. In 1982, John Paul II spoke of the Christian need for, quote, a due awareness of the faith and religious life of the Jewish people as they are professed and practiced still today. The most recent document goes farther still, the document of December of 2015. What day was that? Isn't it shocking? Last year, it seems. Last year's document. It's three weeks ago. Last year's document. God revealed himself in his word. For Jews, the word can be learned through the Torah and the tradition based on it. The Torah is the instruction for a successful life in right relationship with God. By observing the Torah, the Jew receives a share in communion with God. It's a remarkable statement. Far beyond anything that was in the document of 1965. If skeptics took note of the absence of reference to a living Judaism in Nostra Aetate, the presence of the very word and everything it implies and the actions of subsequent popes belie that concern, lay that concern to rest. That's where the show up. In 1979, Pope John Paul II, who had himself, of course, experienced uh, the horrors of the Shoah growing up as he did in Poland, became the first pope to visit Auschwitz, where he prayed for the victims of the Shoah. Throughout his papacy, he would refer to the tragedy of the destruction of Jewish life in Europe. Later, when a group of Carmelite nuns erected a cross at Auschwitz, the Pope himself intervened, recognizing that its presence was disrespectful of the Jewish legacy of Auschwitz. In November 1990, Pope John Paul II said, for Christians, the heavy burden of the guilt for the murder of the Jewish people must be an enduring call to repentance. 1998, the Commission on Religious Relations with the Jews released a document called we remember a reflection on the Shoah, which opened the way to explicitly discuss that horror and explore the role of Catholic teaching in preparing the way for it. Later, Pope Benedict also visited the death camp and spoke frequently about the Shoah and its meaning uh, in Jewish life. And today, just today, uh, we learned that Pope Francis is planning to uh, make his pilgrimage to Auschwitz uh, later this year. That painful subject, left unspoken in the document, has been unequivocally addressed in actions and in words in the years since. Perhaps the most glaring omission in Nostra Aetate 
is any mention of the existence of the state of Israel. The document does not give a hint that such an entity was in existence as it was being written, nor that that entity was of consequence in the way that Jews understood themselves. It is true that while the document was still being debated, Pope Paul VI visited there. Uh, but what a strange and strained trip it was. He spoke of his trip as a spiritual pilgrimage to the Holy Land, and never in terms of the living Jewish state. He never mentioned the name Israel, nor did he meet with any official of that state. When he later wrote to the president of Israel, uh, Zaman Shazar, he sent the letter to Mr. Zaman Shazar Tel Aviv, uh, without mentioning his title, or acknowledging the fact that uh, the president's official residence was not in Tel Aviv, uh, but in Jerusalem, the capital of Israel, and of course, not using the country name Israel. But when Pope John Paul II visited in the year 2000, things were very different. His plane landed at Ben-Gurion Airport and he was formally received by President Azir Weizmann, uh, whom he visited in his official residence. On that visit, he met with Israel's two chief rabbis. He visited Yad Vashem, the Holocaust Memorial, and met with victims of the Shoah and most significantly and poignantly, he prayed at the Western Wall. But of course, by the time of his trip, uh, the, state of the Vatican and the State of Israel had established full bilateral diplomatic relations. Those establishment of relations was a profound evolution in the relationship uh, between the Vatican and the Jewish people. John Paul II's footsteps to Israel were followed by his successor, Benedict, uh, and by the time Pope Francis ascended the throne of St. Peter, it had become a matter of course uh, for the Pope to visit Israel. And in fact, Pope Francis made his journey very early in his papacy. He too uh, visited Yad Vashem, met with survivors of the Holocaust, and like his predecessors, prayed at the Western Wall. But Pope Francis added a visit that made his trip unique. He became the first Pope to visit the grave of Theodore Herzl, the founding father of political Zionism. And he laid a wreath at Herzl's grave. A remarkable affirmation of the reality of the Jewish state. Also a far cry from an incident in the life of Herzl himself. In 1904, Herzl visited one of Francis's predecessors, Pope Pius X, uh, to enlist his support for Herzl's great dream, the creation of a Jewish state. Uh, in response to Herzl's plea, the Pope said, Quote, we cannot give approval to this movement. We cannot prevent the Jews from going to Jerusalem, but we could never sanction it. The Jews have not recognized our Lord. Therefore, we cannot recognize the Jewish people. If you come to Palestine and settle your people there, we will be ready with priests and churches to baptize you all. <laughs> a warm welcome. What a far <laughs> distance we have traveled from Herzl being rejected by Pope Pius X to Francis laying a wreath on Herzl's grave. A journey impossible without Nostra Aetate, even if the name Israel wasn't mentioned in the document. And then, this past October, as part of a celebration of that document, Pope Francis brought the issue to its final evolution when he said, to attack Jews is anti-Semitism, but an outright attack on the state of Israel is also anti-Semitism. If Nostra Aetate, the document, was silent about the state of Israel, Nostra Aetate, the process, certainly is not. By the way, that last sentence of Pope Pius X about having churches and priests ready to baptize us all uh, brings us to the last two items uh, on that list of words not present in Nostra Aetate, the document. Supersessionism, and conversion, evangelizing Jews. I choose to treat these two topics together because both rest on the notion the Jew that the Jewish tradition, Jewish religion is a dead religion. Uh, the people an empty husk and worthy of and needing to be brought to a truer faith. The fact is that each of these issues has been grappled with by the church in the intervening years.
I think it's been an excruciatingly difficult process for the church because if this, uh, of, of all the questions to deal with, this is probably the hardest. Because on one hand, the church does want to reach out to Jews, but on the other hand, its self-identity is wrapped up in the commission to evangelize. Uh, we see this struggle in the 1974 guidelines and suggestions for the implementation of the Conciliar Declaration of Nostra Aetate. Here's what they said, here's what they said, 1974, which is nine years after it said it was due. In virtue of her divine mission and her very nature, the church must preach Jesus Christ to the world. Lest the witness of Catholics to Jesus Christ should give offense to the Jews, they must take care to live and spread their Christian faith while maintaining the strictest respect for religious liberty in line with the teaching of the Second Vatican Council. And here they cite Dignitatis Humanae. They will likewise strive to understand the difficulties which arise for the Jewish soul, rightly imbued with an extremely high, pure notion of the divine transcendence in faith with the mystery of the incarnate word. Here, the issue is couched in terms of what Murray would identify as political or social civil rights. Now with this most recent document of last December, I would argue that for the first time, the church has formally addressed these issues that are so much at the heart of the relationship of true mutuality and respect. On the issue of supersessionism, the document says, on the part of many of the church fathers, the so-called replacement theory or supersessionism steadily gained favor until in the Middle Ages it represented the standard theological foundation of the relationship with Judaism. The promises and commitments of God would no longer apply to Israel because it had not recognized Jesus as Messiah and the Son of God, but had been transferred to the Church of Jesus Christ, which was now the new Israel, the chosen people of God, with its declaration of Nostra Aetate, the church unequivocally professes within a new theological framework the replacement of supersessionism theory. Theology is deprived of its foundation. Very clear statement with regard to supersessionism. Here we see the evolution of the document from the document on which it stands. A clear making explicit of a perspective which may at best have been implicit in Nostra Aetate, the document. An unambiguous rejection of a position which the document itself asserts was, quote, a standard theological foundation of church teaching. By itself, this assertion represents a profound step forward in the relationship. But no less radical is the assertion in the very last section of the document that addresses, quote, the church's mandate to evangelize in relation to Judaism. It states, it is easy to understand that the so-called mission to the Jews is a very delicate and sensitive matter for them because in their eyes, it involves the very existence of the Jewish people. The church is therefore obliged to view evangelization to Jews who believe in the one God in a different manner from that to people of other religions and worldviews. In concrete terms, this means that the Catholic Church neither conducts nor supports any specific institutional mission work directed towards Jews. It's, it's possible that this affirmation is the, is the statement that the whole document has been building toward. It is a remarkable evolution beyond the reticence of Nostra Aetate to address this complicated issue and beyond the hesitance of the intervening years. It is a fitting way to celebrate this 50th anniversary of the document that made this affirmation possible. In sum, much as we celebrate the document that was affirmed on October 28, 1965, we have far greater cause to rejoice in what has flowed from it, filling in the lacunae of that document and elaborating on the tentative affirmations that it contained, so that today we stand in far greater mutuality and cooperation than we could have imagined when Nostra Aetate was promulgated. Uh, let me note that not all of the evolution has been on the Catholic side. Soon after the process began, one Jewish skeptic said, what we need from this, what they need from this is to understand themselves. What we need is for them to leave us alone. The observation 
trivialize the enormity of the transformation and ignore the profundity of what had taken place. It failed to understand as well that the process of Nostra Aetate had consequences and meaning for Jews as well as for Catholics. In these past 50 years, there have been consequential Jewish responses. Institutionally, at the suggestion of the church in 1970, the various Jewish organizations that engaged with dialogue with the church formed a common entity called the, it's a long name, International Jewish Committee and Interreligious Consultation, IJCIC for short, a condominium, uh, whose very existence has been called a miracle wrought by the Catholic Church inside the Jewish community. Upon its creation, IJCIC and the Commission on Religious Relations with the Jews formed a joint entity, here's more initials, known as the International Catholic Jewish Liaison Committee, the ILC, which meets every two years to exchange perspectives and to monitor the state of the relationship. At these IOC meetings and at regular and formal, uh, and formal consultations between the, the two years, the two communities of faith exchange concerns and clarify issues that will inevitably arise. So Ichkik is one of the responses uh, as, as an entity to, uh, to Vatican II. Uh, but there have been other responses. Significantly, my friend and colleague David Samuel of the Anti-Defamation League has written that in response to Nostra Aetate, uh, there have been several attempts by Jews to formulate positions on Christianity. Uh, he identifies four, and he notes that all four of them, by and large, have been, un by definition, have been personal uh, or uno certainly unofficial. The one that comes closest to having some kind of official imprimatur uh, was a document called Dabru Emet on which Rabbi Samuel worked, a statement uh, that was written in the year 2000. Uh, written by several Jewish academics, was published as an ad in the New York Times, signed by over 200 rabbis and thinkers uh, from across the whole spectrum of Jewish life. Dabur Ahmed focuses on eight major affirmations that Jews must make about Christianity. Eight affirmations Jews must make about Christianity. One, Jews and Christians worship the same God. By the way, it's published in the New York Times, which makes it both true and official. <laughs> One, Jews and Christians worship the same God. Two, Jews and Christians seek authority from the same book. Three, Christians can respect the claim of the Jews on the land of Israel. Four, Jews and Christians together accept the moral principles of the Torah, the Pentateuch. Five, Nazism is not a Christian phenomenon. Six, the controversy between Jews and Christians will not be settled until God redeems the entire world as promised from Scripture, and no one should be pressed into believing another's belief. Seven, a new relationship between Jews and Christians will not weaken Jewish practice. And eight, Jews and Christians must work together for justice and peace. And then this past year, two additional Jewish statements with official sanction from the leaders of the French Jewish community and a very nuanced and I think significantly theological statement from a group of Orthodox rabbis from around the world, which includes the assertion, we Jews and Christians have more in common than what divides us, and both Jews and Christians have a common covenantal mission to perfect the world under the sovereignty of the Almighty. Such Jewish statements would have been inconceivable before Nostra Aetate. I think it is important for us to recognize uh, that, uh, that Nostra Aetate was a document that changed not only the Catholic community but the Jewish community. I think it is of profound importance to, for us to take note of the fact that the Jewish community itself has been profoundly changed by Nostra Aetate. In the 2,000 years of recrimination, threat, and death, we ourselves adopted attitudes and have not only a fear, but a reciprocated contempt and suspicion. Nostra Aetate has lifted from our shoulders our burden of suspicion, resentment, contempt and hatred, which corrode the soul and distort the spirit. Liberated from the need for self-defense and derogation, we are free to engage with the literature of early Christianity, not creedly, not through the eyes of faith, but to look at it without any sense of betrayal of our own identity as a product of a particular moment in our history, an essential window on, under, on a fuller understanding and a fuller appreciation of the reality of Judaism in flux during the Second Temple period and beyond. 
from Nostra Aetate, the process, both communities are engaging in sincere and constructive dialogue, and both have emerged changed. I want to say just a few quick words about what I think Nostra Aetate means, and then, then we'll have a chance to talk together. Uh, what, does, what, what does the whole thing mean? Uh, I think, number one, I think it, it, it represents an embrace of the idea that people of faith share perspectives and values across doctrinal lines uh, that differ from those of non-believers uh, or people with, uh, with, a, with a different non-religious ideology. Uh, perhaps what Cardinal Francis George called a godly humanism. Two, Nostra Aetate, I think, is an embodiment of human hope. Think about this. If these two communities, which have been separated by 2,000 years of the most intense estrangement, can reconcile, can come to call one another brothers, then what human problem could possibly be insurmountable? What division between people cannot be overcome? Nostra Aetate stands as a beacon for this fraught moment. Our rapprochement becomes an, an, an emblem of what can yet happen and what yet must happen between other communities of faith. It does represent the conversation that must still be held with Islam. Nostra Aetate is uh, an embodiment of how change happens. Uh, change didn't happen from the middle. Change happened from the fringes uh, and moves toward the middle. All progress moves toward the middle. Uh, Nostra Aetate, I think, represents, calls us to, uh, calls us to address the issue of secularism. What is secularism? Murray makes the distinction between uh, what he calls Jacobin laicist versions of secularism, which is hostile to religion and mandates a hostility to religion, and the American version of secularism, which involves religion not making use of the instruments of government to impose its perspectives on people. Of course, there's another spec secularism as well. There's a, there's a personal secularism, which involves a person's general disengagement with religion. In Vatican circles these days, there seems to be a great deal of discussion and concern about secularism. Nostra Aetate raises the obligation to be precise about the nature of what secular, what, what secularism is it that is concerning us. Historically, Nostra Aetate represents an unarticulated transformation in the church. It is a familiar accusation that religion is a source of conflict and all of us recognize that this sadly is too often the case. The corollary of this charge must be that religion becomes destructive when it is linked with power. Nostra Aetate, along with Dignitatis Humanae, represents a Catholic Church divesting itself of power, which is very much at the heart of Murray's teaching. He endorses religion's right to participate in debates convincing people of its perspective. He rejects the idea of religious groups exercising coercive power. And that represents the secular model to which all religious traditions must aspire. We must, religious traditions must learn to live with the role of convincing, persuading, teaching, uh, but not exercising external power. Two quick theological lessons. Dignitatis Humanae represents the beginning of a new theology of religion. Uh, that is, religion in the civil society, which must include civil and human rights. As Father Christian Rupesizer, the provincial of the Swiss Jesuit, says, to put the human being and his relations to truth at the center, not doctrine. Father Sidney Griffith of Catholic University says, before Nostra Aetate, any dialogue is a con conversation with the infinite. Nostra Aetate knows that. Now we are talking with a fellow human being. New type of religion. Uh, and this raises the second theological issue embodied in Nostra Aetate. John Talakowski raises this issue very gingerly. He writes, in the development of Christianity's dialogue with other world religions, especially Islam, the new perspective on Christian self-understanding emerging from the uh, scholarship involved in Christian-Jewish dialogue needs to take center stage. We cannot conduct these other dialogues as if the dialogue with Judaism has not significantly altered Christianity's classical self-perception and self-expression. In getting to this point, we can trace an interesting historical evolution that moves us beyond Murray's thought. 
Nostra Aetate represents a new theology. I'm going to call it religious humility. It rests on a new paradigm. The old paradigm asserted whoever we are. The old paradigm asserted we have all the truth. In 1864, Pope Pius IX addressed the issue, the idea that, quote, liberty of conscience and worship is each man's personal right. 1864. Responding to that idea, Pope Pius called that idea insane. <laughs> That's the position that Murray was arguing against, even if his position often put him in the ill graces of his church. In 1953, 12 years before the Second Vatican Council, Pope Pius XII allowed for, quote, the toleration of error. There's no, no duty to repress religious or moral error. And Murray says, in embrace of pluralism means we must allow for other, we must allow other faiths, even if they're wrong. <laughs> even if they're wrong. That's a form of toleration, which can be seen as condescending. Uh, it is certainly paternalistic, rather than fraternal. Nostra aetate is fraternal. And it is here that Nostra Aetate moves beyond Murray's toleration, uh, and with it the suggestion that those other faiths are wrong. In November 1964, when Nostra Aetate was being debated, John Danielli, later Cardinal Danielli, serving as an expert, said, this text makes Christianity one religion among others. Though he may not have meant that as an endorsement, I believe that that is finally the theology of Nostra Aetate, a theology of humility, of relinquishing the claim to exclusive truth. Christianity becomes, Judaism becomes, the Hindu tradition becomes, Islam becomes, one religious tradition among others. That has been embodied not only in the, in the words of reply to Nostra Aetate, it's been embodied in the actions of all of the of the of the popes uh, in the years since, uh, embodied in convocations in places uh, like Assisi, uh, or if the uh, if the uh, if the November if the if the 9/11 uh, monument uh, in Lower Manhattan. And so we close as we begin. We are blessed to be part of a remarkable religious transformation, rem as great as any humanity has ever experienced. It calls to mind for me the narrative arc of the book of Genesis, the first book of the scripture that we share. It is bookended by two stories of brothers. The first act features Cain and Abel, envy, hatred, and bloodshed, and the profound question that resonates throughout the rest of the text, am I my brother's keeper? And the book concludes, Genesis concludes with the narrative of Joseph, starting also with envy and hatred and brutal separation. At the conclusion of the story, the climax, a powerful dramatization of the reintegration of a shattered family, a reconciliation of renewed love, and the affirmative answer to that first question, am I my brother's keeper, is an emphatic yes. In the Talmud, one discussion hinges on how we can know when it's morning. One modern commentator is answered by teaching it is morning when you can see the face of your brother. Of course, that leaves us with the question, who is our brother or our sister? Nostra Aetate and all that flowed from it has moved Jews and Christians toward the dawning of the light when we can see one another's faces and know that we are brothers. We have traveled a great narrative arc. Let us give thanks to God that he has given us life and sustained us and let us be part of this moment. Amen.
of work is to make sure that the, that the lessons of Nostra Aetate get spread to the global south uh, where the church is growing and where there are uh, no or very few live Jews to counterbalance the image of Jews that is propagated in the teaching. One piece of work. Uh, another piece of work. Um, I talked about. Uh, I talked about the the uh, bilateral diplomatic relations between the Catholic, between the Vatican uh, and the uh, and the State of Israel. And I talked about the relationship between the Catholic Church and the Jews. I think that the, the Catholic Church still has a ways to go to fully appreciate the uh, the religious role that the State of Israel has for Jews. Uh, it's a hard concept to understand, but the relationship of Jews to the state of Israel is not merely a political <coughs> relationship. So I would say that there's, there's that work to do. For the Jews, uh, the work involves, number one, I, I don't know that we've done a very good job of kind of spreading the word that Nostra Aetate exists. Mm -hmm. uh, so that there's all kinds of Jews wandering around, and so we assume that, uh, that the Catholic Church views Jews the way that it did in 1963. Uh, so, you know, that's certainly, that's, that's, that's our failing, and it's one that rectify. Um, for Jews, uh, I don't know that we do a good, I think that we are still stuck in the pre-Vatican II way of teaching about, about Christianity. Uh, and uh, that, that I think that, you know, kind of people said, uh, free from the burden of recrimination and fear, uh, we need to talk about, uh, we need to teach uh, Jewish children and Jewish adults about the religion of their neighbors uh, and about, uh, you know, in, in kind of a more compassionate discussion of the interplay of Christianity very positive thing too. And we, we need to talk about I think we need to talk about that. Uh, for, for, and I, and I, I, this I believe very strongly. Uh, I don't know that Jews have done an adequate job, and perhaps this is something I meant to make explicit. I don't think we've done an adequate job of creating a theology of the Christianity of Christians, by which I mean we often, uh, when, we, when, when we talk, we're tr we're trying to make sense of Christian Christianity. Uh, we'll take refuge in uh, what's called the Noahide Covenant, uh, which shows up in the book of Genesis. And so we're happy to recognize that Christians are participating in the Noahide Covenant, which means uh, you're human beings. The second is a terrific theological breakthrough, don't you? The question is, is it a very complicated theological The complicated theological question becomes, what do we make of the, of the Christianity of Christian Christians, of Christian human beings? Uh, so th I think that's, that's, a, that's a tough part. That's a, that's a tough piece of work. I think we have to do that. Uh, and for Jews and for, and, and for Catholics both. Can I just talk loud? Yeah. 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 All right. Yeah. Yeah. For Jews and for Catholics both, uh, we have not yet articulated, we have not yet created a theology uh, that, that deals with the religiousness of other human beings in general. Well, that is, you know, why did God create different groups of folks with different understandings of, of God? Uh, that's a, that's a, that's a, you know, I think that's a, that's a worthy theological project. It's probably not one that's going to be going to be concluded in the next fifty years. Uh, so when we get together again to celebrate the hundredth anniversary, <laughs> it probably won't be finished. But I, but, it, but it, it's a, but it's a project, and sooner or later it will get worked on. It needs to get worked on. Well, what is the trajectory uh, of this process that we're in? Process is when we come to Marxism, that is. Well, I have to confess, uh, I was I was uh, taken by surprise by the document of, of October 2015. I, I, thought that, I, thought, I thought that, I mean, you know, that, that moved things, I think, forward <coughs> so dramatically uh, that uh, I mean, it, it, was, it, it sort of speeded things up so, so much uh, that I, I couldn't begin to predict uh, you know, what would happen in five years. Uh, but um, it, well, let, me, let me just note that I think that it, 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 just about every level, relations, between Jews and Catholics, and I know I use the term Catholic and Christian interchangeably in the talk, but the relationship between Jews and Catholics uh, is, a, is a very strong relationship now. Uh, on, on, the, on the local level, my, uh, my friend Father McGinley and I can talk about, you know, uh, just among local congregations, um, there's good, strong relations among the individual Catholics.
against individual Jews, uh, the kind of hostility that our grandparents would have taken for granted does not exist. Uh, and, and at the highest level, uh, you know, the, 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 the dialogue between the, the Jewish community is represented by the, by the various organizations and the Vatican, uh, I, I think is, is, is strong and solid. What is not as solid uh, is the relationship with various other Christian groups. So that the, the, in many ways, Vatican II uh, created a spillover from the Catholic Church to other Christian groups, but not everybody is, is has, uh, has picked up the has picked up the, uh, the the challenge of what Vatican II is. So I, in, in looking forward, Jews and Catholics are going to be engaged in educating other kinds of Christian people, Eastern Orthodox, various other various Protestant groups, and so forth. I think that education is going to take place collaboratively. And of course, the most important challenge, the greatest challenge in the world today, is is as people of not you know we talk about non Christians, non Jews, non Muslims. Are going to need to find a way of entering into some kind of conversation with the, with the with the Muslim world, uh, and uh, my guess is that that uh, in the end that's that too is going to be important. You're looking for 100 years now. Jews and Catholics are going to be involved in finding a way to to uh, to in, to involving the Muslim world in the spirit, uh, you know, spirit of conflict. Uh, if Jews aren't going to be able to do it by themselves, I don't think the church is going to be able to do it by itself either. Perhaps. Uh, and by the way, I, I will say, I believe that the Vatican is very much aware of that. The, the Vatican, I think, wants to use the reality of, of what we have accomplished in 50 years as a model for what can be accomplished and what needs to be accomplished uh, in, in other kinds of issues. I think the one that is most keenly on their mind uh, is, is uh, Islam. Uh, Functionally, yes. I mean, I mean, I, on a practical level, I, I think that, 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 that most of the conversations that take place, and these conversations that take place, uh, both nationally and internationally, are with representatives of the Catholic Church. So to that extent, it is it's certainly, I think, the strongest uh, relationship that the Jewish community has. Um, but the, I bet the question where you're going to go is, do Jews, do Jews feel the same kind of, of sui generis relationship with Islam? Uh, and uh, so here's the theological question. I think that Jews and Christians must see themselves as also having a, a, a similar unique relationship with Islam. After all, it is our child. Uh, and, it is, and it is the other monotheistic faith. And it is, it is the other faith that references the same book that we share. Uh, so that uh, ultimately, so 50 years from now, hopefully, we will find it inescapable to to include uh, Islam in the, in this embrace of of, of fraternity. Uh, you know, it, 
which has always been kind of modeled for me by, by the uh, staff, you know, I, I, when I was in Paris, just two summers ago, and I went to Notre Dame, and I walked in, and you go, you go in the main door of Notre Dame, and you see uh, these two statues of the, of, the, of the church and the synagogue. Uh, uh, the, 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 uh, the church, you know, wearing a crown and, and regal and the synagogue all broken down with a broken staff and all of that. Uh, so that, that's what religion is for. Uh, it's, it's remarkable to me uh, that, that these two entities treat one another in a kind of, it's, it's seen as kind of uh, on a parity. After all, they, you know, they, the, the church comprising, what is it, a billion and a half people, uh, and the, the Jewish world comprising, I think, maybe half a dozen of them. Or <laughs> <laughs> uh, treating one another as equal is, is, is itself remarkable. Uh, I, I, I don't know if I said this clearly in the talk, I don't know if I said it at all. Um, but I think it's important, that we, I mean, the, the, the mission that we have to each other, that we, that we now recognize the, the commonality of religious folks. Think about that. I, I mean, maybe it, if, if, when I say it now, it sounds like an empty cliche, it sounds like a platitude. Uh, I, it would not have sounded like a platitude in 1965. Uh, you know, the, the notion that there are certain values and perceptions and ways of being that religious people share that is different than the worldview of folks uh, who, who are not religious. Uh, and that that, religion, that, 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 that religiousness uh, links us together in, 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 more than, in more than bonds of friendship, right? In more than bonds of respect. That knowing that in, a, in one important way, we're kind of coming from the same place. That's, you know, to be able to say that and for the document to, to imply that, I think that's, I mean, that's, quite, that's quite significant. Now, in terms of sui generis, I, 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 would, I, I do argue you know, that, 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 that the real Islam that does exist, I don't know why it's excluded from that. It, it, it's very, it's hard, you know, it's hard to talk about that now. I understand that the world is, the world is in flames and the world is a bloody place right now. But the reality of Islam is that it participates in that too. Uh, and so you, if, you, if you want to talk about the great unfinished task, that, that is the great unfinished task. It's going to be a task of several lifetimes, I understand, but, you know, that, that all of us would, would be working with that. about bringing this message to the global south. Is that there's, there's tremendous uh, misunderstanding. My travels in Latin America and my working with Latinos has made me aware of that. But there's a real problem with the old world right now, the reemergence of anti-Semitism in countries that perhaps are right now nominally Catholic, unfortunately. But you take Poland, which yeah. is very explicitly Catholic, the, the country of Pope John Paul, where Anti-Semitism is alarming. Hungary, uh, Slovakia. Uh, what, you know, where, where is Nostra Aetate there? Exactly. Yes, that's exactly right. And so, at, at this point, when, when the Jewish world talks to the Vatican about the Catholic Church, that's the question that it asks. You know, it, it is, uh, this, in, when, this, when this relationship is, is, is fully matured, it's, 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 it's very far along the way, when it's fully matured, the church will reflectively, reflexively, talk to its own, right? And say, this is this is not the way that we talk. Cut it out. And, and, and there are instances where it does that. There are instances where it does that. Um, I, I'm, I'm assuming that it's time to find this. This gets back to Matt's question. You know, what do you see in the next 50 years? I think that that, that will become increasingly part of the role of the, the, that the church sees for itself right. is to is to address that when it takes place in nominally <coughs> Catholic places.
historians might be particularly precious to us, we are free to uh, think of a new way of uh, giving a God of this sort. That would make us appreciate the stories of others, but be free to imagine new stories of our own. Mm. And since that article was published, I haven't heard another word about it. Mm. I wonder if it could take root at all in the Jewish community. <coughs> My mind is wandering back to those to the two hours that are on the cutting room floor. Uh, and one of the things I said is, you know, looking forward, these both Catholics and Jews do want to be careful with the word Vasilla and Charybdis. Vasilla, on one hand, uh, kind of being estrangement, you know, and, and, and thinking of ourselves in <coughs> silos. The Charybdis being syncretism. Uh, so that uh, that we, I, I think we, you know, both communities want to be careful that Nostra Aetate does not become a vehicle for syncretism. So that, uh, from where I sit, the Christian, the, 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 the Christian self-interest stories are terrific for Christians. Uh, and I wouldn't, I wouldn't want to monkey with those. I wouldn't want Christians to adapt those or to change those to accommodate me. Uh, and I would want Christians to recognize that, and we don't use the word salvation in the same way that Christians do, but the, but the Jewish stories are adequate for Jews. Uh, and, and don't need to be kind of reconfigured or rewritten uh, to, to fit us into, into, into a loving relationship with Catholics. happened, but there was enough of it in the new world. 
But but certainly it was you know it was it was largely a European disease. America, for whatever reason, threw us into different kinds, especially Jews and Catholics actually, right? Threw us into relationship with one another. When you when you talk about you talk about Murray's role in in Vatican II in general, he's bringing American perspective. And we look at Nostra Aetate, a part of a significant part of the advocacy for for the for the document was from American cardinals and bishops, because because they lived in that kind of of relationship. They 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 had positive human interaction with Jews, and so they they would push they they push including rather conservative American cardinals advocated strongly for the adoption. You don't mention Pius the Twelfth, but I'll mail you an article that where he says to a young man who needed help from the Vatican, "Be proud to be a Jew," and you'll look because the Wehrmacht can't go and visit him anywhere. And I it's afterwards I'll send you the send you that article because I know we're very funny about talking about him, but I happen to be proud. Thank you very much. At any rate, thank you. That's my concern: is young people and how they act and how he relates to our brothers and sisters in other religions, especially our Jewish brothers and sisters. Thank you. I think what I need and many people need is an explication of your remark that after Nostra Aetate, part of the work that has to be done is to appreciate the religious significance of the state of Israel to Judaism, and especially since in your very excellent explication of Nostra Aetate, you mentioned that John Courtney Murray said that one of the important things was Catholicism to be freed from the sense of power, where they no longer had to exercise power. Well, the state of Israel, I mean, just by being a state, creates monstrous questions of power. So now you give me the opportunity to say a little more about that. Nobody asked me, I'll ask myself, nobody asked me why I thought that the creation of the state of Israel was a factor in Nostra Aetate. And so let me make this suggestion. One of the old teachings of the church was that proof of the fact that the covenant had been moved from the Jews to the new Israel was the fact that Israel was now, those Jews were now living in dispersion. They were driven from their land, a powerless kind of zombie people. And so the church at some point had to ask itself the question that Pope Pius X was wrestling with. You know, what do you do if these people come back to the land? If the diaspora was proof that they were a cursor, they have to come to terms with the fact that, you know, they're back there now. What do you do with that? So I believe that on some level that that played a role in Nostra Aetate. Now, you raise another question. When I talked about religion freed from political coercion, I did not exclude Jews from that. I mean, that certainly, I believe that that is part of the process that the Catholic Church was going through in Nostra Aetate and Dignitatis Humanae. But that doesn't mean that Jews are not immune from that virus as well. So that a problem with the state of Israel is those people who, within Israel, right, you know, want to use the instrumentalities of the state to apply religious perspective, religious coercion. You know, I, you know, with Murray, I would have to say, you know, that that's obviously, that's anathema. That doesn't obviate the fact that the existence of a Jewish state, I'm not talking about a theocracy, and I'm not talking about a state that mandates religion, but the re-emergence of a Jewish state is more than political meaning could choose. That it is a compelling, it is compelling for us on a level beyond political and diplomatic. It is, it is, it is a, it is a religious reality for us, which does not mean, you know, that the state has the right to apply coercion to people's religious behavior. Those are two separate categories. I think we are about to close. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for the great care that you gave to this presentation. Thank you for your thoughtfulness. Thank you for your generosity and your openness. And on that note, we will close the hearing.
thank you